Welcome everybody. So um, things have gone a little slower than planned and we have just crossed the halfway. This is the sixth lecture out of 10. Um, and so what I will do um, with the material that I couldn't present, it's a bit embarrassing because I told you I'll present a field theory example of pi one. And I also told you I'll present a pi one, which is non-abelian. Actually, there are a lot of pi ones I would like to present and they're all in the book but I'm going to make them into exercises in somewhat detail and I'll urge you to do them. Now a word about exercises. Uh, I've stopped sharing that screen. I'm going to show you instead another screen, which is this one. And uh, you see, I have way of snooping on people's visits to my blog page. Uh, I'll, uh, I remind you that there is such a page. Uh, if you don't have the link, some of you joined this course late, I'll post it again. But the fact is that out of nearly 200 who were attending till last, last time, uh, not that many have accessed the exercises. Uh, 68 visits usually doesn't even mean 68 people. And if you see in the last two, three days, it's just two or three uh, visits uh, per day. So moral of the story is that people are happy to ask me questions, but not happy to work out things uh, for themselves. It's your choice, of course. It's an informal course, but I promise you that you'll learn more if you do the exercises, literally by taking uh, each question and writing down the answer, unless you're sure that you know how this all works. Of course, some people attending are experts, but I think uh, from the questions, I sense that many people are struggling with these abstract ideas and are often getting confused about what they mean. And the best way to resolve it is work it out. And the best uh, you know, example, I don't know if it's already in the exercises or if not, it will be there next time, is to find this famous continuous function on a set of three elements. If you've done that, then you've made some progress to understanding topology. And if you haven't done that, then you haven't made a very important piece of progress. OK. so. Uh, I like to scold my classes in Iser Pune. This is not Iser Pune. This is uh, gen much more general, but anyway, uh, that's the scolding for today. And let us now start with the central, one of the perhaps most central themes of the mini course, which is differentiable manifold. So what are these? Now for this, I'm first going to do a recap of what we know about Rn in usual topology. Uh, I showed you quite explicitly how the usual topology looks like on R, okay, the real line, but we didn't spend any time really working with R2, R3, R4, but now it will be important to do that. So let's take an example just for fun. Let's take R2. Okay, so what are the open sets in the usual topology? Well, you could address this two different ways and you'll get two different answers. One way you would say, let's do the metric topology because usual R2 has a usual metric, which is the distance. So there are open disks. So there are open disks. Every open disk then will be an open set. And these will form a basis. So, any union of open disks, any finite intersection of open disks. Take all these things together and you get the topology. That's the collection of all open sets. Hmm? Now note right away that it's a little different from what happened in one dimension. For R, if we took two open intervals and we overlapped them, then we got an open interval. So in R, uh, this is one and this is the other. And so the intersection of overlapping intervals, open intervals, is another open interval. 
And remember, these open intervals are basically the open disks in one dimension, hmm? the set of all points that are at a less than a fixed distance from some origin, which would be the center of the open interval. Okay. But in R2, it's a little different. In R2, if I take an open disk and I take another open disk, uh, actually for this, I really want to draw open disks and my drawing is horrible, but I think there's a trick in hopefully in my software. Yes, there it is. And here's one and here's another one. Uh, this didn't magically become a circle. Okay. Anyway, so the intersection is that. Okay. And this is definitely not an open disk, but it is an open set. Why is it an open set? Because in the metric topology, every intersection of open disks has to be an open set. That's the law. Okay, but it's a weird shaped open set. It's shaped like that. Now, of course, what it does, it does have the feature we would like to expect, namely it doesn't contain its boundary because it's the intersection of two open disks. And because the left one is open, this boundary is not contained. And because the right one is open, this boundary is not contained. So the whole boundary is not contained. So that's good, but the shape is odd, okay? So now you have to do, you can do lots of things. You can get all kinds of shapes. This is a new feature, right? In 1D, you couldn't have shapes. In two or three dimensions, you can have lots of fun making shapes. You can intersect three of these and you'll get another weird kind of shape, which is this one over here, okay? So there are lots of open sets and nobody said that it's a simple collection. Nobody said it's a small collection. Obviously it's infinite, but it also has the property that it looks like all kinds of strange shapes. So this is what this was one way uh, to discuss uh, to decide. Uh, so I didn't write this, I think. Yeah, metric. So this is one metric topology on R2. But supposing I take a different, apparently different topology, I say that R2 is just the product of two real lines. Each of them has its open intervals. So and unions of those, these open intervals form a basis. So let me take open interval, cross open interval, and what do I get? Well, I get a rectangle, which is open, right? In one direction, it's an open interval uh, like this, and in the other direction, it's an open interval like that. If I take the direct product, I get the open rectangle, okay? And just as intervals, open intervals were a basis for the usual topology on R, open rectangles should be a basis uh, for the usual topology uh, on R2. But of course, open disks should also be, and open rectangles don't look such a lot like open disks. Nevertheless, it must be true, and actually it is true, that every open rectangle, I hope you understand what I meant by open when I said open rectangle, I mean one that doesn't contain its boundary points. Uh, can be written. This is a provable statement, but it's tedious to prove. At least uh, I don't know one line of one line proof as a union of open disks. Now remember that in taking unions, you are allowed infinitely many. There's no limit on how many. So it might you might need infinitely many open disks to make exactly an open rectangle. Okay. The fun part is that every open disk can also be written as similarly as a union of rectangles. Again, making a perfect disk out of rectangles may require um, infinitely many, it's too bad. So the point I'm trying to stress here is that when I have a, a topology, even as simple a topology as usual topology on R2, uh, a basis can be up to me and one basis may not look too much like another. Admittedly, there is some resemblance, which is that if I a little bit take this open rectangle and smoothen the edges and round it a bit, it will become a circle and vice versa. If I take the circle and flatten, it will become a rectangle. The crucial property of these kind of open sets that they don't contain their boundary is maintained. Uh, both for open rectangles and open disks, but it's not that the basis looks anything like each other. And it's not like any generic open set in R2 looks either like an open rectangle or like an open disk. Hmm? It could look like anything. Actually, frankly, it could be pretty much any shape. 
this is an important point to mention to avoid confusion uh, because i think you never actually saw the variety of open sets that r2 contains in its usual topology same is true for r3 okay and you can get into all kinds of exciting questions because uh, you know you could imagine um, a spiral shaped open set uh, and so there are nice examples in the topology literature the old literature on topology in mathematics and you can have very weird uh, sets with very weird properties uh, by suitably combining these basis sets okay so it's not just right away obvious what's an open set you have to think a little bit even in the usual topology yeah good okay so that's one point another point that i want to make before i embark on this is the uh, relative or induced topology on a subset now let's take an example in order to ask this question take uh, r2 and take any open sets you like but now let me take a circle which is inside r2 okay so this uh whoops is a circle okay so it's not the disk it's not the inside of the circle it's just the circle itself okay now there should be an induced or relative topology on this circle due to open sets in r2 which we already agreed that we know so how will i find them well i should have perhaps drawn the circle in a different color never mind so obviously i'll take some open uh, set in r2 and which intersects the circle like that and i'll shade it to show that it's actually the whole disk and now where does it intersect with the circle well it intersects over this line which i am coloring red here right and of course the end points are not included because they are not in this uh, they are not in this uh, open disk okay so finally what i get is the uh, open interval on a circle not very hard to imagine so you just take that circle and mark off some thing like this and this is an open set so in the um usual topology on r2 i can induce something which looks very much like a usual topology on uh, on s1 but s1 is a different space okay part of our job now will in fact be to talk about in what sense s1 is a different space okay so i just wanted to uh, make the point that we get it by intersecting open sets uh intersecting the given subset i've said this before probably but i uh, just want to remind you of it uh with open sets of the um original space so i have a subset of some original set the original set has a given topology so it has open sets i take those i intersect with the subset wherever it intersects whatever that intersection is is declared to be an open set in the subspace uh and it's called the subspace topology okay so just keep that in mind so in this way we the circle is also defined as a topological space likewise the surface of a sphere and so on okay now uh now that we've done all this and remember we've always behaved as if these r and euclidean spaces are very familiar to us like there's nothing new we could learn about them because what are they just direct product of set of real numbers but let's prove a theorem which relies on topology okay so the theorem uh well we are not going to as usual prove it but the theorem says that r m and r n are not homeomorphic uh if m is not equal to n homeomorphism is a one to one on to map of topological spaces which is continuous in both directions no such map exists between rm and rn now as we have seen in the discussions Uh, when you say no such map exists what are you going to do are you going to list all all possible maps no because there could have been infinitely many how do you know some clever soul won't find the continuous map both ways between these two that's not how one works instead of that 
uh, we keep in mind that we have developed a lot of properties of topological spaces like connectedness, simple connectedness, path connectedness, blah, blah, blah. And if any of those doesn't match between RM and RN, then they cannot be homeomorphic because if they were homeomorphic, all topological properties should match. Okay, so let's uh, prove. So example, uh, R is not homeomorphic to R2. I hope you haven't forgotten what homeomorphism is. It's a equivalence map between topological spaces. So this says that R and R2 are not equivalent as topological spaces. Okay, now uh, the proof is for this case is very easy. Okay, uh, assume a homo homeomorphism exists. Exists, so this is the contrary to what we want to prove. Now delete the origin or any point, uh, point zero from R and corresponding point from R2. If there's a homeomorphism, then any point in R will have an image under this homeomorphism. That's the corresponding point. So delete it on both sides. So what's the picture now? I have R, but I've deleted a point, which I'll show like that. And then I have R2, and I've deleted a point, which is the image of this point under the supposed homeomorphism. Well, now it's easy to prove that if that homeomorphism did exist, then this new space R minus a point is also homeomorphic. The same map is a homeomorphism between R minus zero and R two minus a point in the relative topology. So, uh, so this means that there exists a homeomorphism between these two spaces. Because there was one before, I deleted one one point following the homeomorphism. It, it takes a little thought, so don't jump on me yet, but it, it implies that there is also a homeomorphism between, uh, sorry, sorry, this one is not R2, between R minus a point and R2 minus the corresponding point. Okay, but this can't be true because we already proved that the left side is disconnected. R minus a point is disconnected. You can see it from the picture and it's a union of two open sets. While the right one is easy to prove is still connected. Can't be written as the union of disjoint open sets. Okay, because LHS is disconnected and the RHS is connected. Since that is so, there can't be such a homeomorphism since that is the case, therefore, there couldn't have been a homeomorphism from the beginning. So we've proved this uh, property. R is not homeomorphic to R2. Now, from this, you can pretty much guess how the remaining cases go. But just to, just to have a little fun, uh, similarly, compare R2 and R3. OK? So supposing there's a homeomorphism, we want to prove again that there isn't any homeomorphism, but if there was one, then it would, uh, if there was a homeo homeomorphism, then uh, there's also one from R2 minus a point to R3 minus a point. Okay, and this point need not be the origin, it's the image of the homeomorphism. But now you see, of course, both sides are still connected. If I remove a point from R2 and R3, they're still connected. But now this one is not simply connected. If you remember, we explained last time what it means to be simply connected. Uh, simply connected is that the pi one is trivial. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that if I have a loop going around that missing point, it can't be continuously shrunk to the constant loop. So this has a non-trivial pi one. However, this uh, it's very easy also to see if I take uh, the volume of space and delete one point, I can still shrink any loop because I can just take the loop away from that point and there I can shrink it. So it doesn't require any work to see that this one is 
not simply connected. This is uh, simply connected. Therefore, there can't be a homeomorphism between these two. Therefore, there couldn't have been one between R2 and R3. So we've also proved that R2 is not homeomorphic to R3. It's very easy to extend this proof by deleting a line, deleting a plane, deleting something from both sides. And you can eventually prove uh, that so R in, in general, I, I have not proved it. There are people who jump on me for saying things without proof. I have not proved it, but I have given you plenty of indication uh, uh, that um, Rm and Rn are not homeomorphic can be proved in this way. There are also steps in my, even the proof that I gave, which you need to fill in. For example, the original continuous function on the original space remains a continuous function in the relative topology on the space after I remove a point. Good. So we've learned something. This is really an important thing. That means that the number M or N has a topological meaning. It would, that is, it can't be um, changed by homeomorphism. That's the same as the previous underlined statement. Okay, so we call this the dimension of R M. So if I take M copies of the real line, then that M is called the dimension. Now I didn't need to do all this to tell you what M is. It's the number of copies. Okay, but the concept of dimension is broader and we are now going to be dealing with spaces which have a dimension. Okay, in the same sense that RM has a dimension, we'll find other spaces, topological spaces, not general ones, not generic ones, special ones, but which will have a concept of dimension. They'll also have some other properties and eventually they will turn into manifolds. Okay, so we'll uh, develop this in uh, now slowly, uh, not too slowly. So now let's consider, um, okay. So next let's prove the following result. Let's look at the circle S1, which I told you can be thought of just as a subset of R2 in the usual topology. And let's look at R. Now R we decided has dimension one and S1 without, we haven't proved anything. We haven't even def defined what is its dimension, but looking at it, it looks pretty one dimensional. That's why we put the one on top, okay? It's a circle and everybody knows, so to say that a circle is one dimensional. So here we have a circle and we have a real line. They have the same dimension. I'm just talking a little intuitively and with motivation now. So could they be homeomorphic? At least it's worth asking. Okay, we've seen that you can't change dimension by homeomorphism, but maybe you can have a homeomorphism between S1 as a topological space and R as a topological space, both in the usual topology. S1's usual topology is the relative topology of R2. So, but it's not true. So S1 is not homeomorphic to R. Okay, and this can be proved in a similar manner as above, except that now we don't invoke the concept of dimension. We don't compare spaces of a diff what seem to be different dimension, but still this, we can do the play the same game. So take S1 minus a point and you can easily see that it's connected, but take R minus a point and of course it's disconnected. So again, if you uh, if you if you understand these facts and if you verify them, then you'll see that S1 is not homeomorphic to R. So S1 minus a point would look like this. And you can see that it's connected, but you can also prove it. It's not the union of uh, disjoint open sets in the induced topology on S1, okay? But R has its usual topology. And of course it is disconnected when I remove a point, okay? So because these properties don't match, that proves this statement. So we are able to prove a bunch of statements uh, which are topological in nature, but now they are about spaces that have something to do with Euclidean space. In I, we've discussed spaces like Rn, which are nothing but products of Euclidean spaces. And we've discussed spaces like S1, which are not products of Euclidean spaces, but they can be thought of as embedded inside a Euclidean space. It's a subspace 
with the subspace topology coming from a higher dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, good. So now the question then is what common, okay, likewise, okay, I should have said here right away. Similarly, S2 is not homeomorphic to R2. Now R2 is the plane and S2 is uh, the two sphere, what we call the surface of a sphere. These are not homeomorphic. I'll leave the proof as an exercise to you. It's as easy as the ones I've done before. And more generally, Sn is not homeomorphic to Rn. So now comes a motivational question. What is the common property? of Sn and Rn uh, that allows us to use the same N for, you, for both. Given that they are not homeomorphic to each other. Okay, how do we define it? I've used word dimension loosely, but I haven't defined dimension of Sn. Okay, again, uh, remind you, Sn is the n-dimensional sphere thought of as a subspace of Rn plus one, it's just the same way we defined S1. You can define any sphere that way. Okay, so here's the answer that uh, they are locally homeomorphic. Now, uh, this is just a made up expression, but I can give it a precise definition. So Sn and Rn are both what I'd like to call n-dimensional spaces, okay? They are topological spaces that I've told you already how to define them as topological spaces, but I'm adding the new feature that they are n-dimensional. And I claim that this uh, property uh, is something uh, that comes from local homeomorphism, and now I can define it. So I'll define it and then I'll pause for the first round of questions. Okay, so now very precise definition. Let M be a topological space. Okay, a chart on M, on M is a collection um, U, phi n where it's of collection of three things u as the notation suggests is an open set of m m is at the moment any topological space so it comes with a capital u topology which is a collection of open sets and small u is one of those any one of those okay now phi so this is one Two, phi is a homeomorphism from U, this open set, to its image phi of U, which is in, uh, which is a subset of Rn. Okay, and three. N is a positive integer called the dimension of the chart. Okay, so what did we do with this? We'll draw a picture and it will hopefully become a little clearer. Okay, I've taken a topological space M. I picked a particular open set small u, it's already given by the topology. By adding a homeomorphism phi associated to an integer n, I'm assigning a new structure to it, which is called a chart. So that open set is then a chart. But if the chart is not just the set, it's the set and the homeomorphism. But what does the homeomorphism do? It maps that open set of m into uh, Euclidean space Rn for some n. 
Okay. Now notice that because phi is a homeomorphism, first of all, phi can operate both ways. Phi can also, it's one to one and on to. So this open set U is being mapped in a one to one and on to way on phi of U, which is a subset of R. Okay. So if you want, you can picture it like this. Here's my topological uh, space M. Here is my Rn. Okay. Here I pick a subset called U and phi takes it to a subset of Rn called phi of U. Okay. So every point inside U has gone to a unique point inside phi of U. Okay. But phi is continuous and it's one to one and on to, therefore it's inverse is also, and it's inverse is also continuous. So it's both ways continuous. That's part of saying it's a homeomorphism. Now in general, this thing is not always possible. For example, if my M was the abstract topological space of my table, lamp, desk, and laptop, then there's no homeomorphism from any subset of it to a subset of, uh, to an open set of Rn. Remember, that I can't choose my phi of u arbitrarily. Why? Because phi is a homeomorphism and u is an open set of m. Okay. Therefore, phi of u is necessarily an open set of Rn. Hmm. So this image can only be an open set of Rn. Okay. I might be able to take a u in some small topological space with three elements and map uh, them to a point in Rn, but that's no good because a point is not an open set in Rn, then I won't get a homeomorphism. Okay, so this singles out certain topological spaces M, which in which such a thing actually exists in a general topological space, there may be no chart. Okay, now if we want to use words, we can say a chart is a piece of a topological space with a homeomorphism that equates it to a piece of Euclidean space. And this is exactly what I meant here when I use the word locally homeomorphic, okay? So once I have this concept of uh, a topological space having a chart, then I can start to talk of dimension because the dimension of this chart is the N such that the image of this uh, map of, the, of this open set, which is this one, is an open set in Rn, okay? And I, I emphasize that although there are many types of open sets in Rn, uh, they are all n-dimensional, okay? Points, lines, things like that are not open sets in Rn. Okay, so that's the definition of a chart. And very roughly what it says is, my M is something that's like Euclidean space locally. And now if I take many of such charts and piece them together, I can reconstruct my top full topological space M such that every part of it has a homeomorphism to a part of Euclidean space. Now that's very good because that's the thing that's going to lead us to a manifold, which I'll define next. So I'll turn to questions now and then we'll get on to manifolds. I also haven't told you what is the goal of studying manifolds. I'll tell you that in a minute. Yes, uh, Agam in R, we could have knotted open sets, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, RM. Uh, yeah, exactly. The Dhruv has answered the question. So the point is that bijective map by itself cannot distinguish RM from RN, but it won't be continuous in both directions. That is what, and that continuity is what captures the topological property. And that's why topology was important. And that's why we spent so much time talking about abstract topology. Even though finally we are talking about our old friends, RM and RN, we are talking about them in the language of abstract topology. And it's only in that language that they are not equivalent. You need topology, the concept of open sets to say that they're not equivalent. Hmm? Yeah, uh, Kaushalesh, please, please, a lot of patience. Uh, holographic correspondence is not a homeomorphism between Rn and Rm, I assure you. Uh, field theory is not Rm or Rn. It's an infinite, field theory is based on infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And all these rules don't exist for infinite dimension because uh, there's no, nothing called M or N. So infinite dimensional manifold is a very scary subject. Uh, and field theory, quantum field theory for better or worse, uh, it makes use of an infinite dimensional space. 
So no, none of this applies. Is S1 minus zero homeomorphic to R? Uh, yes, it is actually. I, I think I'll come to that later. Yes, uh, hyperbolic spaces, uh, I don't know. Uh, anything which is N and M dimensional is not hom uh, homeomorphic. Thank you, Sanjana, yes. Equivalence symbol, okay, let's not get bogged down in symbols here, please. Uh, you have to understand the context. There are only so many equivalent symbols in, in, in life. So I'll use whichever one I, I can use. Can the dimensions of different charts for the same topological space be different? I'm a very good question. And the answer in general is yes. Okay. You could have a topological space which has different open sets, have different dimensional charts. Okay. And that one isn't going to become a manifold. So this is sort of the point. Uh, it'll only be, so we already defined a subclass of topological spaces, which admit charts. Now we'll define a further subclass, which can be covered by charts, all of the same dimension. And that's when the fun will start. Is it absolutely impossible to define a homeomorphism for a set like table chair lamp? Yes. Uh, no, you can define a homeomorphism, but not to Rn for any n. Hmm? That's the problem. Uh, you can probably define it to three copies of a point, but that's not Rn. That's the that's the whole the difference. Hmm? Yeah, n points of R1 are mapped on a single point on S1. Hmm. Yeah, I, we don't need more proofs of S1 and R1 not being homeomorphic. I've given. spaces. So when we are defining a homeomorphism from U, which is an open set in M, uh, the sentence didn't end either. So what, uh, what is the question? Sorry. Everything is right so far. What's the question? Doesn't seem to be a question. Um, whatever you're called, if you um, um, figure out a question, please post it. How can we define a homeomorphism from an open set? Aha. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, a, a homeomorphism on an open set uh, is simply, okay, let's, let's see. Yes. Uh, it's, it's always defined in the relative topology. Okay. So, at some point, one has to stop saying that. So U as an open set inherits a relative topology from M. Now there'll be further subsets inside U, which might have been in M, and those will be in the topology of U. And there'll be intersections of sets in M, which are not fully uh, inside U, uh, with uh, U, and those intersections will also be in the relative topology. So homeomorphism is well defined, yeah, yeah. Once we have a open set, it can be homeomorphic to Rn for exactly one n, right? Yes. Uh, can we assign the dimension to just u instead of the chart? You know that. Um, uh, okay. I mean, it's slightly just words, Neil. But I think uh, first thing is, of course, yeah, it can it can be homeomorphic to Rn for exactly one n. That much is true. Uh, you know how you want to assign the dimension. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's assigned to the chart. Let's just say that, okay? Homeomorphisms aren't defined between only topological spaces. Well, Abhishek, they are defined between only topological spaces because they are based on the concept of continuity. So if I want to define it on subsets of topological spaces, then it has to be defined in the relative topology. The key point is that because relative topology is such a relatively straightforward notion and subsets are very basic, so we never have to keep saying relative topology. If I have a topology, then any subset on it comes for free with a relative topology. You don't have to make up a new one for it. Hmm? Yeah. Can I use a chart to define dimension of M? It seems like it will depend on both U and phi. Cyan, uh, you should have been listening. I said that we'll define the dimension of M in a few minutes, uh, and I will. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Something to be, it must, yeah, good, Amit, yeah, good question. For something to be homeomorphic to an open set of Rn, it must have infinite elements. Absolutely, that is very true. It must have infinite elements. 
uh, and yes, um, um, true. So therefore, in fact, in particular, just any topological space M, uh, such as the weird ones that I kept discussing for the first few lectures, uh, no longer uh, are under discussion because they don't admit charts. So I can't do anything that I'm going to do from now onwards with them. So those of you who never liked my topological space of lamp and uh, table and so on, uh, will be happy because those spaces now are dead from our discussion. But I, I, I emphasize that they were important for a reason. They were important for us to know what is topological as opposed to any other equal. Hmm. Topological is a type of property of spaces. Even now, we are still going to keep talking of homeomorphisms. And it's best to understand what is a homo homeomorphism in complete generality. Okay, one to one, on to, and both ways continuous, and continuous means inverse image of open sets or open sets. Good. So, with that, I can get back to uh, the discussion. And now uh, we'll sort of answer the question. Okay, maybe we'll postpone the question. Let's see. Uh, yes, okay. A few more definitions, then we'll bring up the important question. Okay. Um, Given a chart, oops, given a chart, each point in phi of U can be labeled by Cartesian coordinates. Of Rn. The beautiful thing about Rn, because it's a Cartesian product of real lines, and each real line has a coordinate number, a number x. So x1, x2, xn, x3 up to xn will be the coordinates of any point in Rn. Okay. So we've achieved something interesting. We didn't have any labeling of points in a topological space or in its uh, open sets, right? But now, because of this chart, we have a labeling of points. Uh, in phi of u. Because phi of u is an open set of Rn and Rn has a labeling because of Cartesian coordinates. Now, phi is invertible. Phi is a homeomorphism. It's one to one and on to. So I can invert it pointwise. So every point uh, in uh, this phi of u goes to a unique point in u. So I can use the same coordinate, which was labeling the point in phi of u, as a label for the point in U. So let's write it. Uh, the coordinates, this is a definition. This is now actual definition because it's a definition of coordinates of a point in a chart of a topological space. That's not necessarily Rn. The coordinates of a point P in an open set U which is a subset of M and is open in the topology on M, are the Cartesian coordinates uh, of the point phi of P, which is in phi of U, which is a subset of Rn. So I'm assuming that we know what are Cartesian coordinates, but we don't know what are coordinates in general. And this fact allows me to define the coordinates of a chart using Cartesian coordinates in Rn. That's very beautiful. OK. Uh, in, we can go further as P varies. Oh, OK, never mind that. I think there's no need to say. Some of the fine points are in the book. Huh? Please look, uh, look, uh, look those up yourself. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, now the key point. This is the whole reason. Until now, we could talk of continuous functions in an arbitrary topological space. But we couldn't go one more step and talk of differentiable functions. Because what are we supposed to differentiate? 
Okay, we don't know calculus because an arbitrary top topological space doesn't know calculus. We don't know what it means to take a limit of this minus that and define by divide by the distance and take that distance very small and so on. So how do we differentiate things? For continuity, we didn't need any of that. We needed a very simple concept relatively, which is inverse image of open sets is open, then the function is continuous. But how do we talk of differentiating it and talk of functions which are differentiable? And now we are going to be in a position to do that uh, in a minute, but already we can do it. So if we have a function on M, can be differentiated locally in a chart by differentiating its image in Rn. In other words, I have a function on M M has a, a, a subset, some subset open set U. And in that open set, the function takes each point of that open set somewhere. And now I can differentiate the function by instead of evaluating it on points of U, which are called P above, I evaluate that function, the same function, I associate it with the phi of P, which are the coordinates of that point. Once I know the coordinates of that point, I can do calculus and I can evaluate its derivative. Right now, these are just words, but in a moment, we'll make this more precise. So the whole idea here is to make differentiable functions, to allow differentiability. And however, here we have only said that you can differentiate them locally. And the reason is that as far as we know, our topological space has just one chart of some dimension n. We don't even know if it has any more charts. But now, since we would like to differentiate the function on the whole space and not just on one chart, we'll try to generalize the concept of chart to cover the whole space. Now I'll remind you about something from maps. Okay, a chart in a map is a region of the map. I have a map of the, of the earth. Okay, and a chart might be one of them which contains, for example, India or which contains Sri Lanka or which contains, or, or which contains part of different countries. Nature doesn't know geographical boundaries, but a chart is any part of the map of the earth, okay? But the whole map of the earth is better than having just charts because then I can navigate anywhere I want, okay? For individual regions, I will pull out the chart of that region, but if I'm interested in understanding what I want, an atlas, and the word atlas is used. Uh, an atlas in the old days was a book, still is, I suppose, where each page is a chart. And by going through the whole atlas and understanding how different pages continue to the following or previous page, you cover the whole globe. And that's the concept we're going to use here. And it actually has the same name. So, um, well, in a second, first we are going to make a definition about compatibility and then we'll uh, introduce an atlas. Okay, so let, uh, C1, chart one, which is an open set U1 with its homeomorphism phi one and N. And uh, C2 equals another open set, another homeomorphism, but the same N. Uh, Okay, so now let's, we, are, we want to compare these two charts in case U1 and U2 overlap. So remember how the atlas was made. I just told you that first I make a chart, then I make another chart. Then I have to have a rule that I know how to go from the first chart to the second chart. Okay, if I'm actually uh, on a sea voyage and I'm opening one chart uh, and I want, and I'm about to move off the edge of that page of my atlas. Okay, how do I know where I am on the next page? Well, part of the edge of this chart is going to be on the chart on some other page. I have to find that. And then I also have to be sure to map that overlapping region between two charts uh, from the system I was using in one chart to the system in the other chart. And that's something we're trying to do now. So comparing charts when they overlap is important. Okay, so one thing we'll do first is to say that uh, 
um, two charts like this are are said to be compatible if one of the following is true either they don't overlap the intersection of the two charts sorry this is not the homeomorphism phi this is the empty set phi null set if they don't overlap, then I don't care, right? They're compatible. There's no, then never going to be the case that I'm in a ship on one of them and I need to find out where I am on the other chart. It's not going to happen. So that's okay. But if they, if they do intersect, so this or, or means in the case when they do intersect, the maps phi one composed with phi two inverse, which takes me, so I, this is quite complicated to write, but it's very simple as soon as I draw a picture, so be patient. And the reverse. Are both differentiable functions. Now, before I explain all this, let's just note that differentiable for physicists and mathematicians has slightly different meaning. Mathematicians often encounter, actually so do we, functions that can be differentiated once, but not more than once, okay? The function might have a uh, discontinuous discontinuity in its first derivative, then its second derivative won't exist at that point, okay? So we use the word C infinity, that means infinitely differentiable. That means it can be differentiated any number of times. If you don't want C infinity, if that's too strong for you, you can use C superscript J, where J is any integer. And if say J is two, then it means they can be differentiated twice, okay? So, uh, so we'll assume that. Okay, so what was this about compatible charts? Well, as soon as I draw a picture, everything which was a little complicated up there will become clear. Here's M and here's open set U1 and here's open set U2. Okay, I'm taking them to intersect because if they didn't intersect, there was nothing to understand. Huh? They're com they called compatible if they don't intersect. Now, Notice that if they intersect, then I should mark out the intersection region and that's here, okay? Now, U1 is part of a chart, C1, which comes with a homeomorphism phi1, which takes it to phi of U1, which is in Rn. No, not which is a subset of Rn. And U2 comes with its own chart, uh, which, contains within it a homeomorphism phi two that takes me to another phi uh, two. This is phi one of u one, this is phi two of u two, uh, also in subset of R. Okay, now what about the overlap? Now comes the interesting thing. Obviously this overlap region, which you see here is mapped by this homeomorphism and it will go to some sub part of this image, right? Because the whole of U1 goes to this whole thing. So therefore, uh, since U1 goes to this, so some part of U1 is going to some part of this. At the same time, this overlap can also be mapped by phi2 because it's also in U2, okay? And since U2 is being mapped to this, therefore, this is mapped to some sub region, uh, which I can identify here. Okay, now uh, how do I label these? Well, this shaded region is the image of U1 intersection U2 under phi1. So this is phi1 of U1 intersection U2. And this shaded region likewise is phi2 of U1 intersection U2. Now, if you stare at this for a while, you will get that nice comforting feeling that well, Look, M is a topological space. I don't know much about it. I don't know what I can do with it. I don't know if I can perform standard operations on it. But this space here is just a subset of Rn. 
nothing to be afraid of. Once it's a subset of Rn, it has coordinates and I can do calculus. This is also. So do I have a map between them? Well, yes, I do. Because phi, phi 1 is a homeomorphism, phi 2 is a homeomorphism. That means that phi 1 inverse composed with phi 2 and phi 2 inverse composed with phi 1 are both uh, maps. But in fact, they take me from Rn to Rn. So from here, I can go along this using the map phi 2 composed with phi 1 inverse. What does it do? It takes this region. It says, very good, this region is in the image of phi 1. So I'll take it back here. That's phi 1 inverse. Then now that I'm here, I can go with phi 2 here. That's this phi 2. So the composition of phi 1 inverse and phi 2 is a map from this shaded space to this shaded space. And because these were homeomorphisms and they're perfectly invertible, therefore there's no problem in defining phi 1 inverse. It's all one to one and on to. Not only that, there's another map which goes the other way, which is phi 1 composed with phi 2 inverse. Okay, now if you go back to this definition of compatible, you see that phi 1 composed with phi 2 inverse was a map from phi 2 of this to phi 1 of this. So it was this lower map. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, this upper map. It was this one. And phi 2 of, sorry, I keep getting confused. Anyway, you know what I mean. Phi 2 uh, to phi 1. Uh, so phi 1 composed with phi 2 inverse is this one, right? And then phi 2 composed with phi 1 inverse from this, this to this is this one. Okay, so pictorially it should be much clearer. What I'm now saying is I have n functions of n variables because what is phi 2 uh, composed with phi 1 inverse? Let's now give things a name. Supposing I label points here by x and points here by y, okay, n component vectors, then phi 2 composed with phi 1 is just a set f of x. Okay, and um, phi one composed with phi two inverse is just F inverse. Well, I can just call it G uh, of Y, which are inverse of each other. Okay, now what is this F of X? It's a N component function. That means N independent functions of N independent variables. And now we know how to differentiate such a thing. Okay, we just differentiate each one of the n functions and take its gradient with respect to all the n variables. Those are the derivatives. So we can more conveniently write this as, as fi of xj, where i and j are from 1 up to n. Okay. And so I can certainly define del fi by del f x j, del fi, uh, del 2 fi by del x j squared, del 3, any number of times. I can define it, but it may or may not exist, of course. These are certain functions. If these de derivatives all exist, then uh, the functions are infinitely differentiable and I have compatible charts. Okay, I hope that was clear. So compatibility of charts says that whenever I have two overlapping charts, then the functions uh, between their image with one homeomorphism and the other uh, are related by a differentiable, are, are basically uh, differentiable. Okay. Um, I didn't use physics language yet, but if you want physics language, I can tell it to you in another way. This is an abstract space like the surface of some lumpy bumpy thing, which I don't know how to study in physics. Okay. Uh, what I do is I paste on it a sheet of paper, which I cut out from, which I just cut out and I paste on it. Okay. That's this process. That's this homeomorphism. Pasting is a homeomorphism. Okay, then that way I can label all the points here by my by my piece of paper and whatever I've done, I'll call it X coordinates. 
Now some other person will come along to your lab and on the same surface, uh, she will paste a piece of paper, a different piece of paper, which has different numbers. For example, a given point here might be at the point x1 equals zero and x2 equals seven, but it might be at the point y1 equals three and y2 equals minus nine, okay? Because different person has cut out a different sheet of paper and pasted it there. Then this F is basically the transition in going from one coordinate system to another. So it's what in physics we call a change of coordinates. Okay. Uh, I see there are a few questions. Let's look at them quickly. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ansari Arum. Yes. Disjoint. Op uh, disjoint. No. Disjoint open sets in M cannot have non disjoint open set images in Rn. Remember. Uh, remember the homeomorphism property, but reverse is okay. Uh, if they are overlapping open sets, they could have disjoint or overlapping uh, Im images in R. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't they be compatible if phi two or phi one inverse were not? Uh, oh, composed with phi one inverse were not infinite. It's a definition, uh, Abhishek. It's a definition of compatibility. What other definition do you have in mind? The definition of compatibility is that if phi two composed with phi one inverse and other way around are both infinitely differentiable, then the two charts are compatible. Otherwise, they are called non-compatible. So I don't understand your question. Is the definition? What is the advantage of using manifolds over embeddings of the surface in three D? Very good, Agam. Uh, this is a very broad and general question, and it eventually lands up in the field called algebraic geometry. Uh, basically, uh, you're, you're still a little too early with that question because I haven't defined a manifold, but there are many ways to define a manifold. And the way I'll be defining it is what we might consider the intrinsic way. Namely, I'll define a manifold without any recourse to any embedding in a, another space. Okay. Now, many manifolds under suitable conditions can be found as embeddings also, but you may not you may get confused about their properties if you think of them as embeddings we'll see all that in the future so an intrinsic definition of manifold independent and over and above whether it can also be thought of as an embedding in another space uh, is a good thing to have the first case we'll be studying in fact once we define manifold is a circle okay circle already is clear it's a subset of r2 okay but i'll try to define a circle without making any reference to r2 and with the things I'm the machinery I'm developing, I can do that. Okay. And the fact that it's the same thing you defined in two different ways is very interesting and non trivial. So uh, it's important not to always lean on the crutch of thinking of a manifold as a subspace of something else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as Dhruv said, many manifolds can only be embedded in very, very high dimensions. So there's no rule that a two dimensional manifold has to be embeddable in three dimensional space. Actually, maybe there is for two and three, but in general, there's no rule that an n dimensional manifold can be embedded in n plus one dimensional space. Again, you may have other things you want to preserve in that embedding. So long story, long story ahead, be patient with that. Can we understand xj as basis vectors? Not really. Here they are playing the role of coordinates. There are no vectors. We haven't discussed vectors yet. Okay, Vectors will come, give us time. Uh, there's no sense in which these xj are vectors associated to the topological space M. And please do remember, we are not trying to define anything in Rn. Hmm? We are using Rn as the space we already sort of know because it's Cartesian. It's a Cartesian product with given coordinates. We're trying to find properties of M, the original topological space on which so far we have defined two charts. Now, if you give me a few minutes, I'll define more charts and we'll eventually get a manifold. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, even Abhishek, even if they were finitely differentiable, they would still be compatible. They'd just be called CN compatible. Okay, when you have charts that are compatible, you need to say compatible under what criterion? I've taken the strongest one, C infinity. You can make a weaker one, you still call them compatible. Okay, if you don't give any criterion, then the wise thing to assume is just it means C infinity. 
but you can give a weak, you can say C2 compatible. You can have a C2, C2 differentiable manifold, which will be a manifold in which the charts are only compatible uh, up to functions that are twice differentiable, need not be more than twice differentiable. So like that, yeah, okay. Good, good, good. We are doing reasonably well, but we should press on because now we finally have the big definition, uh, which is the following. Uh, now that we've defined a chart and also compatible charts, we'll say a C infinity atlas. Again, I could have hidden the word C infinity among physicists, we'll just assume it. Uh, and I give it a new name, U, curly U, on uh, topological space, M, is a family of charts. U alpha, comma, phi alpha, N. N is the same in the family. U alpha are different open sets for different alpha of the original space M and phi alpha is the homeomorphism that takes U alpha into a uh, open set of Rn. Okay, so it's a family of charts such that all charts in the family are C infinity compatible. I'll soon stop writing C infinity. So that means it's a family like this. Okay. But this is one property. All charts are C infinity compatible to uh, the collection U alpha is a cover of M. We've defined cover already. It means that if I take the union of all these open sets, it contains M. Since these are all open sets of M, the union can only be equal to M. It can't, it can't be bigger because now there's nothing really, there's nothing outside M. M is the full space. Okay. So, which means precisely that M equals, now there are too many U's and I really apologize, but this is the union symbol. Uh, yeah, I hope this is clear. Hmm? So uh, the second thing is clear. So uh, Atlas, is a set of charts which covers the whole space. So the atlas of the earth is a set of pages, each of which is a chart, but obviously it shouldn't happen that I'm on the open sea and I open go through this atlas and the place where I am is missing from it. it better be there, otherwise it's not a very good atlas. Atlas really should have everything, okay? So it should cover him, that's the first point. Uh, and secondly, the charts U alpha are compatible, what does it mean? Those which don't overlap, I don't care about checking, but those which pairwise overlap, I'll check on the pair on the intersection and I'll check for compatibility as I've just defined, okay? So it should be very clear what's an atlas. It's actually once you have chart and you have compatibility, then atlas is basically a bunch of charts which cover M and are all mutually compatible, can be said very easily. And now we can have some fun. So uh, we can do the following. The question now is, what if uh, somebody makes one atlas and somebody else makes another atlas? Okay, so let's define compatibility of atlases. Two atlases are compatible with each other. So they are assumed to be two atlases that cover the same topological space M. They're compatible with each other if every chart of one is compatible with every chart of the other. Okay, remember, these are two atlases that cover the same space. So obviously the charts of one and the charts of the other will have overlaps. Okay, some overlaps. So on those overlaps, there should always be C infinity compatibility, then the two atlases are also compatible. Now, if we continue thinking about our poor sailor on the high seas, uh, she has two books, 
Okay, one may be an atlas published in Italy and another atlas published in Spain. Okay, now they're different atlases. They're written by different people, by previous voyagers who compiled the atlas. And this person is trying to navigate with both. Now, why this person wants to navigate with both, we won't ask for now. Uh, maybe the, the crew members, some can read Italian, some can read Spanish. So they want to navigate with both. Okay, so now it should be possible that I have pinpointed where I am on one page of one of the atlases, but now I wish to go to the other atlas uh, from where I am so that I can then hand over the, the duties to the sailor who can speak uh, maybe the other language, Spanish, and will use the other atlas. So now I better look for charts in that second atlas which overlap with the chart I'm on. And hopefully if it's compatible, then I can put myself <clears throat> not only continuously, but differentiably in the other <coughs> uh, chart of the other atlas and continue from there. So this is compatibility of atlases. Now an interesting theorem, which is not immediately obvious, you need to spend some time thinking about it. For atlases, compatibility is an equivalence relation. Okay, it's reasonably obvious for the following uh, reason. Uh, what is the equivalence relation? Remember, first of all, it says that the given object should be equivalent to itself. So obviously, if I have an atlas, my charts are already compatible with each other. So if I compare the charts of my original atlas with the charts of the same atlas, obviously they are compatible. So point one of the equivalence relation, uh, which I forget what it's called, reflexive, which means uh, equivalent to itself is ticked. Point two is, uh, supposing all the charts of my first atlas are compatible with the charts of the second atlas, then obviously the sentence is true if I exchange the two atlases. The second charts are compatible with the first, because for any pair of charts, compatibility is a pairwise property. If you one is compatible with other than reverse also. So that's the symmetric property. And the third one is the transitive property. And transitive says that if one, if charts of one atlas are compatible with those of a second atlas, and those in a second atlas are compatible with those in a third atlas, then those of the first are compatible with those of the third. It's basically function of a function. I think you can see that it is also easy. However, the interesting thing is uh, compatibility is not an equivalence relation for charts. And um, I'll actually leave this as an exercise. One of these three fails, I won't tell you which one. You have to remember that uh, for there to be an equivalence relation, it has to always be true. Hmm. And there can be situations where one or other of these properties is not satisfied for charts. So compatibility of atlases is an equivalence relation. Compatibility of charts need not be. Good. Uh, in fact, if you want to entertain yourselves uh, and do a little self-study, uh, think of your sailor uh, who has only a few charts, no complete atlas, and could get into trouble if the if uh, if they're given some limited amount of compatibility and they assume equivalence relation they can get in trouble i'm not going to give you more hints than that okay good now because com compatibility is an equivalence relation for atlases we can partition all atlases into equivalence classes okay therefore all atlases on a topological space M are partitioned <clears throat> into equivalence classes. Okay, very good. Uh, within an equivalence class, you have all the different atlases which are all compatible with each other. In a different class, you have all atlases which among themselves are compatible, but they're not compatible with the ones in the first class. So two incompatible things, okay? Now that's a bit weird. You may ask, could there have been two incompatible 
uh, equivalence classes of atlases on the earth? Well, if they are correct atlases, then surely not. Okay, any uh, atlas which is compatible, uh, any atlas which is correct will be equivalent under compatibility uh, to any other atlas because, right, I mean, that, that's pretty obvious. Now, this analogy is, shouldn't be taken too far because compatibility here is with refer reference to differentiable functions. So it's a little stronger, but it's almost uh, apparent that it's very unlikely to find an incompatible atlas uh, with another one. It doesn't seem like you necessarily can find that. Okay, well, uh, true and not true. So definition, a differentiable manifold is a Okay, so there's a small googly here, but it's not very big, is a Hausdorff. We never insisted our space should be Hausdorff, but now we do. That's part of the definition. I hope you haven't forgotten. That was a simple definition that if there are two points in the topological space, they can be enclosed by completely disjoint open sets. Okay. So, uh, and an equivalence class of atlases. Okay, so uh, second countable. All right, maybe it should be second countable. Um, again, for my purposes, I think I don't want to go into that, but okay, if you say so, uh, let's see what is the second countable. Okay, let's figure that out. Um, another time. Okay, uh, so this. So what am I saying? Uh, first of all, I have a topological space. Okay, then I find, uh, then it's house dot. Let's assume that, otherwise we won't go further. Now I find one atlas on it. Okay, if I find uh, one atlas, now I look around and I try to make theorems for what are all the other possible compatible atlases. And what when I find all compatible ones compatible to my first one, I put that in a bin and say, okay, that uh, class is over. Now I look for a new atlas that isn't compatible with any of the previous ones. Okay, uh, it turns out that it's possible to find such things, but it's not uh, common. It's it's quite rare, but okay, it's quite rare in the sense that there are many topological spaces where you only find one. Uh, equivalence class, and there are other topological spaces where you can find more than one. Okay, so uh, this is the um, definition of differentiable manifold, and I want to highlight a few points for you here, and then I'll stop. One is notice that I never introduced a metric. Many people think that a manifold is something with a metric. That's not true. A differentiable manifold doesn't come with a metric. And there are a lot of things you can do with it before you define a metric. Just as we did a few things with topological spaces before defining atlases and charts, like that with differentiable manifold, there are things you can do before defining a metric. When you define a metric, if you want to, then it will be called a Riemannian manifold. That's a differentiable manifold with a metric. That's considerably later, at least two lectures later, if not three. Okay. Good. So let's summarize the properties of a differentiable manifold. One, locally Euclidean. This is the same statement that there exists charts. It's covered by charts. Okay. Every chart is nothing but the statement that it's locally Euclidean because it's a homeomorphism which sends that part of the manifold to, you, to a subset of Euclidean space. Okay. Now, uh, the second property I haven't proved, but can be proved, locally compact. You'll find this word sometimes in the formal literature and general relativity. This says that every point X in my space has a compact neighborhood. And compact we've discussed. Every open cover admits a finite subcover. Okay. Uh, okay. 
then there are a few more uh, properties i think i don't need to list them here they are in the category of obvious things that we can bring in when we need to use them okay and we'll say uh, also notation uh, is that um the equivalence class of compatible atlases or each rather let's call it each equivalence class of compatible atlases on m is called a differentiable structure okay so if i have two different equivalence classes uh on the same topological space two different classes of compatible atlases then i can say that that topological space admits two different differentiable structures and therefore there are two different ways to make a differentiable manifold okay because each differentiable manifold is one equivalence class Mm, given the space i pick one of the equivalence classes that's a man differentiable manifold i pick another it's a different differentiable manifold but the points are the same because the original uh, m was the same even the topology is the same it's only the differentiable structure that's different which is the structure of charts that's different mm? so you see how different kinds of possibilities exist okay and now i think uh, the most important thing before i close is to give a few examples and hope that you will consider the rest on your own okay so one rn itself is a differentiable manifold in this case i can cover it all with a single chart okay because the whole of rn is an open set in the usual topology on rn because the full set is always an open set okay and then the the homeomorphism to rn is the identity it's a trivial example okay but now we are trying to take this thing to more complicated spaces so now we are going to say that the circle is a manifold when i say a manifold it will mean differentiable manifold few times i might say differentiable uh, likewise when i say space i always mean topological space few times i would say topological okay so you may ask s1 defined as what so let's define define it as x squared plus y squared equals 1 as a subset of r2 defined by its embedding in r2 okay it gets the relative topology now this is an important step and it's an important example i have to to prove that it's a differentiable manifold i have to cover it first of all with open sets and then i have to give you the homeomorphism uh to open sets of r uh of r because i'm going to prove that it's a one dimensional manifold hmm? okay so here's my s1 and what i'll do now is uh take one open so remember what the open sets look like on this in the relative topology they were open intervals in general or unions of those but the whole thing um is not useful because it's not homeomorphic to uh to r you know we've already proved that s1 is not homeomorphic to r it's not even homeomorphic to any subset of r so any open set of r so that's not going to do so let's try this let's remove this point and consider our first open set to be everything else and we can give this uh, coordinates um so this is the in the usual xy coordinates this is the point 1 0 okay and the natural coordinate on this chart is is i'll call it theta 1 which goes from 0 to 2 pi but doesn't include 0 or 2 pi that is this missing point which i've removed okay so theta starts here and traces the circle going from 0 to 2 pi as we normally do now i have to take the circle again and define another chart because this chart didn't cover the it's not an atlas okay so the second time what i'll do is i'll delete this point minus 1 comma 0 and i'll cover it with this chart with this chart which is like this which is like this okay and so on this one 
I'll map it. So this statement is already a homeomorphism to an open set of R because this is the open set zero comma two pi, which is an open set of R, not some element. It's an open set. Okay, so this is the homeomorphism. Similarly, here uh, I'll say that this open set is described by minus pi less than theta one, uh, two uh, less than pi. Okay, so in this case, the homeomorphism has taken me from minus pi to pi, which is also an open set of R. So I've got exactly what I wanted. I've got a chart. It certainly its union of these two clearly covers the whole circle. Okay, remember it covers wastefully because almost every point occurs twice, but that's not a problem. Union doesn't have to be economical. It doesn't cost you anything. So you can take these large charts, no problem at all. But you couldn't have taken a chart without removing one of the points. That's one thing. Now we need a, uh, we need to check that the, we need to define the maps between these two, which exactly are uh, uh, continuous both ways, one to one, on to and differentiable. And it's pretty um, uh, easy to do well. Actually, yeah. So, uh, first of all, I should, yeah. First of all, I guess I didn't define the map. The map is easy to define. I just told you the image of the map. But if this is phi one, then it's just tan inverse y by x. If you do tan inverse y by x, all the points that are other than the excluded point will go to. Uh, this open interval in R. The map phi 2, uh, on the other hand, is also tan inverse phi y by x, but it's on this other uh, branch. So tan inverse requires domain to be specified. And so it's uh, again this map, but it takes me to this set. Now, uh, let's look at the overlaps. So what is phi 1 of u1 intersection u2? Okay, so that's the um, intersection of this with this. Uh, so it's the common part of, uh, okay, how to say it? Uh, phi one of, yeah, U1 intersection U2 over here uh, is just, let me write it first. It's just zero to pi. And phi two of U1 intersection U2 is also zero to pi. Uh, but remember, these are the open sets. They don't contain the endpoints. And now I can write phi, I'll explain it. First, let me write it. Phi 2 composed with phi inverse takes me from one intersection to the un other intersection by the identity. Now, sorry, this is only for this region. So the overlap of this open set with this open set has two regions, the, this region and this region which I'll call upper and lower, okay? So this one I should have said is on the upper region. So on the upper region, it's straightforward because here theta is going from zero to two pi. So in the upper region, it just goes from zero to pi. And here also theta just goes from zero to pi. So the map between them is the identity and that's infinitely differentiable and invertible and everything. So it's very good. The lower region is a little more complicated because for the lower region, phi one of u one intersection u two, that's uh, again the same tan inverse thing. This takes me from pi to two pi. You can see that in the figure, this part in this figure is pi to two pi. But the same region in this figure is minus pi to pi. Okay, so phi two of u1 intersection u2 is minus pi to pi. And now phi2 composed with phi1 inverse is the map which takes theta1 and sends it to theta1 minus 2 pi. Okay, so this map, it's a linear map. It just says theta2 is theta1 minus. So this says theta2 is theta1 minus 2 pi. Okay, now, uh, Theta two equals theta one minus two pi is a linear function. Hmm? Theta two is a coordinate on this R uh, on this one and theta, uh, theta one is a coordinate on this, theta two is a coordinate on this and the function between them is linear. And if it's linear, then it's certainly infinitely differentiable. Okay, very good. So we've proved that by making a cover of um, uh, a chart, uh, an atlas consisting of two charts for S one, 
and considering their overlaps, we can write the so-called transition functions phi one uh, composed with phi two inverse or phi two composed with phi one inverse. And these are functions on ordinary R to R, just from numbers to numbers. And we can inspect visually whether these are C infinity or not. And they are, so we are done. Okay. Now, of course, uh, a lot of people find this strange and ask, you know, how, why are we labeling the circles like this? You're free to label them anyway. What you will never find is that phi two composed with phi one on one of the overlaps is identity and on the other is also identity. There has to be a shift. Okay. Let me point out to you that this shift theta two equals theta one minus two pi is a, is a shift that you have known since you were maybe two years old, three years old. Okay. Because your parents said, look at that clock after 12 o'clock, it's one o'clock again. And if you were a, you know, a, a basic mathematician, you would have told your parents, no, after 12, it's 13. There's no sense in which after 12 comes the number one. Okay. And your parents would have said, well, uh, we are using uh, 12 units to label the circumference of the clock and we're subtracting 12 after every time it crosses 12. So that uh, th that's the shift theta two equals theta one minus two pi. So don't blame me. You've been believing this since a very early age. Okay, it's exactly the reason why there isn't one real number which can tell us the time at all times and still be valued only on the circle. There isn't. It's the same reason. Okay, good. So this was one description of S1. Now there can be others. For example, stereographic projection. It's done in the it's done in the book. And anyway, I'm out of time, so I'll take questions and I'll end here. Yeah, Agam says a metric does exist in Rn, which is at the heart of the manifold. No, it's not quite at the heart of the manifold. That's the whole point. Remember that a homeomorphism is a continuous map, but a continuous map doesn't preserve distances. Continuity exactly is what we otherwise call stretchability. Rubber sheet, remember rubber sheet? Okay, so there's no sense in which the uh, in a given an arbitrary atlas, okay, there's no sense in which the metric of Rn can be transported to the metric of this uh, manifold M. It's an extra thing which we'd have to define. So yes, Rn comes with a natural metric, that's fine, but it doesn't transport in any natural way to my topological space. And I didn't need it also. Remember, I've defined a differentiable structure and now I can differentiate functions. And in fact, next time we'll spend time differentiating functions, lots and lots of uh, possible functions that you can differentiate. They can be from a manifold to Rn or from a manifold to another manifold, okay? And we can differentiate them and there's no metric brought in, okay? Uh, so in general, no, there's no natural metric. Uh, maybe it will help you if I say the following thing. Uh, supposing I would take a two sphere and I would set up all these homeomorphisms and everything to have charts and eventually have an atlas. I make an atlas. You can guess what I would do with the two sphere, right? One chart could be the whole, uh, everything except South Pole. Other chart would be everything except North Pole. And each one will map to some region of R2. And then I'll do the same overlap stuff as I did here, except I have two angles, latitude and longitude, except one uh, instead of one. Okay. But supposing I have the same sphere and now I push it in one place so it gets a dent. Okay. That fact is not captured by this. As a set of points, S2 is S2. So S2 with one metric and S2 with another metric are different metric spaces, but they're the same differentiable manifold. The differentiable structure is the same. The atlases of one are compatible with the atlases of another. So that's the reason why metric is not a natural thing. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, some discussion on that. We are able to define coordinates for these charts only because we ex assume the existence of maps from open sets of these to that of Rn. Absolutely correct. Thank you, Achal Vinod. Uh, supposing I have a CN atlas, is it obvious that we can also construct a CK atlas where K is less than N? I believe so. I think that's correct, Pratiksh. I'm not sure, but uh, never really needed one. I think it's it's true. Uh, you just have to, yeah, uh, yeah, anyway. You see, if it's an atlas, and it that means it covers M, 
and if it's cn then already it covers it uh, such in with homeomorphisms such that on overlaps they are cn now if i want it to be ck for k less than n i can add more charts to this atlas it's free to add more charts i'll just get a more complicated atlas but the original atlas will do okay yeah uh, can i give an example of the case with different differentiable structures on the same topological space kiran good question but please wait patience yeah on a lighter note dhruv says parents should teach modulo 12 arithmetic they did teach it to you the moment they taught you that after 12 o'clock comes 1 o'clock and like a obedient child you said yeah 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 so obvious uh they taught you modular arithmetic they may not have known it you may not have known it but it's still true yeah uh, rn with a point removed is a differentiable manifold sure yes it is uh, now we'll come uh, so okay so sorry uh, there's a new issue uh, it will be a manifold with boundary we haven't talked about manifolds with boundary it's a little extension of what i'm doing so let's not uh, yeah uh, is the minimum number something like a topological property not really then may it's an interesting um, yeah do we not let me first answer shivani's question do we not take charts of different dimension because the image in rn is not homeomorphic well charts of different dimension cannot have a homeomorphism to the same rn in the first place hmm? so if you remember uh, compatibility of charts starts with the fact that i have two charts both with the same dimension n okay if i have two charts of different dimension n and m then each one has a homeomorphism to rn and rm respectively and now i can't uh, consider uh, so now it's yeah it's just not an n dimensional space i can have more general spaces which are not differentiable manifolds which have different dimension at different places i'll give you an example if you want consider a plane and a line through it okay the union of these two things okay so along the points on the line it looks like one dimensional along generic points on the plane it looks two dimensional at the intersection of the plane and the line it looks three dimensional sort of not really three dimensional it actually looks two dimensional in one direction and one dimensional in the other so you know you can have that you can you can just glue you can weld together spaces of different dimension if you want it's not very interesting from our point of view a uh, minimum number of charts then my let me get back to that so actually uh, there's something i wanted to define and i'm wondering if i defined it yet i didn't mention maximal atlas so yeah uh, i don't know where in my notes is maximal atlas but i know it somewhere let give me a second to search for it uh yeah yes 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 it was there i was just missing it okay so comment from each uh from each equivalence class uh of atlases uh we can pick a unique one uh in a clever way just take the union of all atlases the union of all atlases in a class is again an atlas and this union is called a maximal atlas maximal atlas is that uh any class in which the maximal atlas lies all other atlases are contained in the maximal one okay so what's the point of this well you may think it's wasteful and uh, again uh, sorry to keep bringing your parents into this if you were really making charts using chapati and you were taking union of all possible chapatis you would run out of flour and run up a big bill but on the other hand mathematical charts are completely free doesn't cost anything okay not even paid for by your tax money it's actually free okay so you don't have to look for a minimum set of atlases for your definition you for minimum set of charts for your definition on the contrary the best bet is to take the maximal set of charts just take every chart you can think of that is compatible with that hmm. so unlike a sailing ship there's no weight limit so just add everything you get a maximal atlas good thing is now you can say a differentiable structure on a manifold is a maximal atlas one it, it makes the definition much simpler 
Now, this was a slight digression to the question of uh, um, somebody which has vanished now. Uh, minimum number of charts, something like a topological property. So minimum number of charts, I don't think is a very interesting property. I could be wrong. Uh, for physicists, obviously, it's interesting because it saves us work. So, uh, you know, you always try to use the minimum number of charts. And in fact, let me say that in physics, you often get away with two charts. I mean, how many examples we know where two charts is good enough? We also often lie in physics and use one chart, secretly not explaining why it looks like one chart. Of course, there are also spaces which are interesting, but still homeomorphic to Rn. So we can use one chart. So there are a lot of different things one can do, but we should do them case by case. I wouldn't like to state any general theorem about number of charts. Yeah. Yeah, regarding equivalence classes of atlases, can we say that an atlas of Earth would be a different class to an atlas of Mars? No, you can't even compare them because the space M is different. Hmm. Or in all this discussion on differentiable structures, atlases, charts, we fixed the space M. We only, uh, a chart was one open set of that space with its homeomorphism. Then an atlas was many open sets of that space which cover the space. Then another atlas which is compatible is an atlas for the same space. Hmm, the original set of points is the same. Now, of course, if you want to be very mathematical, I mean, Earth is S2 and Mars is also S2. So in that sense, you could identify, you could say that, well, they are homeomorphic to each other. And so now I can make atlases uh, which are compatible for both. But it's one topological space. As soon as you change your topological space, you can't compare atlases. Hmm? So a differentiable manifold is first a topological space. Secondly, a maximal atlas on it. Only those two things, nothing more. Yeah, good, good. Uh, okay, I think I addressed everything. Uh, the only one was Kiran's question. Can I give an example of the case with different differentiable structures on the same space? Actually, uh, it turns out there are some famous spaces where it can be done. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting, but these are called exotic differentiable structures. That means there's one which is the obvious one, which occurs in physics, and then there are others which are difficult to define and exotic, but they are incompatible atlases to my physics one. So the fact that there are multiple differentiable structures possible on the same space is not that exciting for physics, but it's a very important exotic result in mathematics. I'll, I'll list a few examples when I do examples next time. Yeah. Okay, thank you all.